The sun has already begun its descent into the western sky, and shadows begin to creep ever closer. Night is upon us, a night where half of the dreams are nightmares. Mark Leslie is about to introduce you to Bram Stoker award-winning author, Edo Van Belkom, the author of Death Drives a Semi. Peter Straub says that Death Drives a Semi comes at you with a sparkle in its bloodshot eye, a happy twist on its pale lips, and a switchblade tucked into a back pocket of its faded jeans. He also describes it as a soundtrack composed by Frank Zappa and Spike Jones. If you're looking for a fun and eerie way to spend the next hour, huddle close, dear friends, and settle down as near as you can to the warmth and precious light of this roaring fire, as far from those dark shadows as possible. You're about to experience tonight's haunted parlor. vibe of Cap, uh, Camp Floyd there a little bit? Yeah, that's cool opening. That's very nice. Well done. Thank you. Well, Edo, thank you for, here. thanks for joining me in the Haunted Parlor here. I am so thrilled, so excited. And, and a hello to everyone who is watching live. We're going to have some special prizes for you. And just a reminder that if you have any questions that you have for Edo uh, about any of his writing, anything at all, just go ahead and leave that in the comments. We're going to be talking a little bit uh, about, well, your writing in general, but we are celebrating the launch of Death Drives a Semi, which is a um, 25th anniversary edition of one of my favorite short story collections of Mine all Mine too. Time. Yeah. So, Edo, so when you, when you first wrote, <clears throat> okay, so I have in my hand here, this is the, <clears throat> the original edition of Death Drives a Semi from yes. Quarry Press. And then this is the new 25th anniversary edition. And uh, just maybe I'll pop it up on, on screen just for a second so people can see uh, some, of the, some of the fun things that were done. Like, for example, you did the photo shoot for the original book, and then you went back and did a, a photo shoot 25 yeah, years later. Nothing, the same beautiful nothing changed. Right? Nothing changed about the stories, but it all changed hmm. about the author. The yeah. hair's gone, the beard's <laughs> longer. Um, <laughs> Yeah, it was a lot of fun to do that. I mean, and, you know, looking at that photo, I said, wow, <laughs> that 25 years ago, that's a long time, you know? And uh, so I, I was glad that we did that. My wife took both pictures, by the way. So it was a lot of fun. Yeah, yeah. Same beautiful photographer for both of those, uh, both of those shots. Uh, so, um, the 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 origin of you wanting to put together. So, I mean, you you you've always been a horror writer. You've been a writer in general, but you've written a lot of really creepy tales. Was it always horror that interested you? Uh, no, I started out wanting to write science fiction, and uh, early on, I realized that I don't have the head for that. I don't know enough about science, and. Uh, the science fiction that I'm writing, it's kind of like fantasy, not real science. So right. I wandered around looking for what I should uh, write. And <clears throat> I've said this uh, story many times before. I was reading a copy of uh, The October Country by Ray Bradbury. And uh, I was up at the cottage, a rainy day, nothing else to do, reading that book. And after finishing every story, it was like, wow, that was great. You know, and I dived into the next one. And that was great, too. And I went through the whole book very quickly. And when I finished, I said, that's the kind of writer I want to be. I want to write those kind of stories where someone finishes reading it and they say, wow, that was great. Now, that is a huge, lofty goal, right? Yes, I want to be like Ray Bradbury. But uh, with laser focus and steadfast uh, discipline and dedication, I achieved a little bit of that, I hope. And I'm very proud of the stories in... Death Drives a Semi, 20 stories in there, 21 for the anniversary edition, 20 stories in the October Country, 20 of my best. I think uh, certainly the early story is my best, and I think Ray Bradbury had his 20 earliest stories there, the best ones. So it was just um, a moment of uh, you know accomplishment. That's what I set out to do. Here's what I – and I did it. And it was published by Quarry Press, King Ontario, a literary publisher, took a chance on a horror collection. So I was quite pleased by that. And uh, the cover I thought was great at the time, but you've outdone it. It's, it's 
head and shoulders better. And I, I'm really proud of the book now, especially after the cover and all the bells and whistles we put in it. It's really, really gratifying. Yeah, no, I, and again, uh, you, you talk about loving the October country, and I, and I go back to, I was a, a bookseller in a brick-and-mortar bookstore when uh, Death Drives the Semi came out, and loved this so much, because every single story in the collection was fantastic, and, and you just kept reading it and thinking, well, it's hard to pick a favorite, but I got, I had the pleasure of hand-selling this to people. Oh, do you like creepy stories? Oh my God, you're going to love this. This is great, you know? you've read all of Stephen King stuff or whatever, you're looking for something really new and exciting, and he's Canadian. So that was a really cool thing. Um, and I was so disappointed um, to know that the book was no longer in print. I thought, well, we have to do something about that. We have to bring it back. But I do I do want to let uh, the folks who are watching live know, I'm just going to pop up a couple comments here, is please leave a comment, leave a question for Edo, because I have three copies of Death Drives a Semi that are going to get randomly selected for people who leave comments uh, as well yeah a little prize a little halloween treat for you there's another halloween treat coming up later on but i just want to say hello to nikki uh who popped in Hi, nikki. <laughs> and uh and justin not only uh says hello uh but also um wishes uh wishes everyone a happy halloween good evening justin happy halloween to you too tuesday uh, thank you guys for leaving those comments you're already in the draw uh the random draw I'll be doing at the very end of the video. So again, if you're not watching this live, sorry, it's for the people who love comments live. It will be something for everyone up until Halloween, a little treat. But uh, so the, the stories themselves, you collected all of those stories. You convinced the literary press to publish a horror collection? Well, I was doing some work uh, for them. And uh, I the first book I did for them was Northern Dreamers which was a book of uh, oh, interviews yes. with Canadian authors of science fiction, fantasy, and horror, which took me a year and a half to do because I had wow. to interview with like 24 authors or some number like that. So it was uh, a long haul, and I guess they were pleased with it. And, you know, that kind of book sells to every library in Canada, right? Yeah. And so we did all right, and I convinced them that, you know, I, I did support for the book, and I sold copies myself, and I did events and things like that. So... Yeah, they uh, they said yes, and and further to that, I ended up editing a uh, a line of books for Corey briefly called Out of This World. We did um, the Aurora Awards anthology, the Arthur Ellis Awards anthology, and I did a um, anthology of baseball fantasy stories, baseball fantastic, wow. with uh, W. P. Kinsella. That was for um out of this world imprint and when they reprinted death drives a semi it came out in the out of this world uh right impre impression or no you know what i'm talking about it came under that uh, that guy uh, imprint imprint yeah imprint yeah. that's right yeah and uh so i had a bit of a track record i was surprised that the baseball fantastic anthology didn't sell um, more easily especially in mass market paperback i thought it was a a no-brainer it didn't happen but yeah. um so they were they were pleased with uh, what i'd done and uh, i had a good good enough set of stories i sent them more than 20 i think 25 or 30 and they selected the ones for the book and i had no issue with what they selected so oh yeah they did an amazing job um yeah and we did we did everything that we could to try to honor the original edition <laughs> including the font and uh, some of the graphics, et cetera. But one of the bonuses I think that people get in this is there is a story that you wrote, a superhero story that has a dark twist to it. Uh, but there was a, a, a note from the author because it really enhanced the tale. And and I was really eager to see your behind the stories or behind this, yeah, behind the stories stories for all, uh, all the tales. So that's another yeah. thing that was added, right? Yeah, I've got some... If we're going to tell entertaining stories, I'll tell a couple of entertaining stories. The one yeah. the story you're talking about is called An Injustice for Some. And it's about a superhero who gets cancer and can't believe it because he's been fighting evil all his life. And now he has cancer and he kind of feels betrayed. So he sets out on a life of crime. And the first thing he does is he steals the pen that the uh, doctor gives him to sign an autograph for his kid. He says uh, to Billy. 
go to hell, night shadow. And he steals the pen and he leaves the hospital. And that was all based on my wife having cancer at the time and me being in her hospital room and having to do keep working. And uh, Rob Sawyer lent me a portable <laughs> computer, which weighed about 35 pounds, had a glass tube on it. It weighed a ton. <laughs> and it was a job to get it in and out of that room every day. But I wrote a story on it. I wrote that story. And everything in that room and in the whole thing going on, put in the story. And it made for a really powerful thing, especially when you put it in context with the note at the end explaining how it went. But there's stories about the creation of all the stories in Death Drive to I mean, I'll mention two. One is uh, Rat Food, which I co-wrote with David Nickel, won the Bram Stoker Award. Yeah. At the time, I was um, filling in for a woman, a reporter at the, the North York Mirror, who was on maternity leave. Somebody had done that and, and left, and there was like three months left, and I took that over. My friend David Nickel helping me with that. And now we were talking, you know, one day, ah, I got this idea of a story about this old lady who's got rats in her house, and she starts feeding them so they don't come around at the wrong times when people are over and things like that. And then I had a certain way of ending it. And he says, no, no, the way it should end is this. And I'm going, oh, man, that's brilliant. So we did back and forth writing each other's pieces. And this was before everyone was on computers and everyone spoke the same language or was possible to send stories back and forth. Right. I was working in WordStark, thanks to Rob Sawyer, and he was working in Microsoft Word. And we couldn't make the stories gel. We had to physically get together with paper and pen and make wow. it, it go. And we couldn't get it published. And uh, it got tweaked a little by J.N. Williamson. Any horror author or horror reader knows Jerry Williamson. Maybe not. I mean, he did a ton of paperbacks in the 90s. Yeah. I think he's faded away now. But he was doing an anthology called Masks. And we sent it there and he said, I can't use it, but here's how you should fix it up. And he spent like three or four pages how we should fix it. And we did. And we took everything that he'd said and he put it in there. We still couldn't find a place to publish it. It was amazing. Yeah. Like, are you kidding me? This story's great. And then uh, we ended up sending it on spec, the Canadian magazine, and they published it. But that was perfect for us because... We had the perfect excuse to send it to every member of HWA, the voting members. Right. Say, oh, this appeared in a small Canadian magazine. You probably didn't see it. We're very proud of it. Here you go. If you want to consider it, great. And that's, I think, what uh, tipped the balance. So uh, fortuitous in, uh, in the end. And the other, the other uh, interesting story is about the rug, which is a Bram Stoker Award finalist. And that appeared in the HWA anthology, Robert Block Psychos, which I was thrilled to be able to yeah. submit to a store uh, an anthology uh, edited by Robert Block. Unfortunately, he passed away before the whole thing was completed. But as I was writing it, I'm writing this story about this rug that's, you know, kind of eating people. And like, and I'm just, I, I stopped halfway through. It's like, this is stupid. What a stupid story. <laughs> and I'm thinking, I can never make this work. And then they sent out a, a release saying, you know, we're running short on and, uh, submissions to Robert Block Psycho. So if you've got a story, finish it and send it along. And I, well, that's Jesus talking to me right there. He's just saying, Ado, you got to finish that story. So I did. Right. And it was accepted and published there and ended up being a finalist for the Stoker. And uh, I think it's very close to the style and feel that a Robert Block uh, story would have, you know, the yeah. humor and the horror to it. And the ending is typical me, but typical him too, like that kind of ending. Yeah. So you get all those explanations and, and notes in the, in the book. And I'm quite pleased because I thought at the time when it was first published, those kind of things are like uh, really, um, you know, arrogant, like, Oh, let me tell you how I wrote this story. It's, you know, it's so good. You have to know the story behind it. And it's just, you know, I'm not full of myself that way. But, hey, 25-year anniversary edition, I'm going to put all the bells and whistles in it. Let's put do an introduction. Let's do a story notes for everything. You know, let's do put everything we can in there and just have some fun with it. So I'm glad we did, and I thank you for it. 
Yeah, no, no. I mean, that's one of my favorite things is just hearing. I mean, when you go to an event, like we're, we're doing this virtually, but if we were in a bookstore or library or, or brewery, perhaps we, we may have done something eventually, uh, recently. Um, I love the opportunity that you get to hear uh, a little bit about the writer, about the story. So, so that leads me, when you talked about, uh, you know, uh, rat food and you talked about the rug and how the stories almost didn't make it, but you persisted. And, and then the other thing, because I think persistence is, is a key uh, element for success for a writer. But the other thing I think um, was you listened to uh, J.N. Williamson, right? Oh, the, the, the feedback that the editor had. How, how important is that for a writer to listen to the editorial feedback? Okay, a couple of things there uh, to talk about. One is uh, aspiring writers are often only interested in their own work. Nobody else's. And that's a right. stumbling block. Um, and you also mentioned persistence. There's uh, When I give talks on writing, I always I talk about these. There's three things that contribute to eventual success. Talent, right? Perseverance, very important. And no one ever gets the third one, which is luck. And I always say that because you need at least two of those three to succeed. You can have talent and persevere and have eventual success. You can have talent and get lucky, right? But you can also persevere and get lucky. And talent has nothing to do with it. it it's, you know, okay, you have to make, put words together and make a sentence. But you don't yeah. have to necessarily have a blazing talent. Persistence is more important than, than talent oftentimes. Because I know a lot of people when I started were a lot better at, than I was at writing. But I persisted, studied the craft, practiced a lot. Now, you mentioned accepting criticism. I honed my talent as a member of the Cecil Street Irregulars. I don't know if you've heard of that group before. Dave Nichol was in that. Um, Carl Schrader, um, Michael Skeet, Hugh Spencer, Corey Doctorow later after I'd left. But uh, we spent, uh, I spent two years there meeting once a week and discussing two short stories per week, critiquing them, changing them. And I would always put mine in. I got always try to have mine one going ready to go. And um, that's how I learned two years of that. You learn like, Oh, there's that mistake. Don't do that anymore. Oh, someone's yeah. going to say something about this. Don't do that anymore. And then eventually you weren't making those mistakes and I didn't need the group anymore. If I had a problem, I'd go to one person that I, whose opinion I trusted, get their feedback, and that would be it. But finally, to your thing about uh, Jerry Williamson, this guy was a pro. Published, you know, dozens of novels. The, I don't know, 100 short stories. He was like, and I read all of them. I can't remember what any one particular one was about now. But at the time, I thought, these are great. So, of course, he was giving us feedback and we you know we looked and said yeah yeah that's probably right and, oh yeah yeah that's good too and we pared it down probably took up five pages off or cleaned it up or whatever and it made it what it was so yeah if someone whose opinion here's another thing i know i'm going on and on but you asked me about writing no this is this is writing, valuable information yeah if you're an aspiring writer and you want to get some feedback you have to approach somebody whose opinion you trust or respect and who has no stake in your overall happiness because they're going to tell you things and they're going to bullshit you because they don't want to upset you and they want to get on with their life and not have you be miserable around them. So someone who doesn't care if they tell you the truth and it hurts your feelings, it's part of the process. I used to even give a talk on thriving on rejection about how it's so important to be able to accept criticism, keep going, and persist. Uh, so, yeah, if, if a pro who's done that many novels, you know, gives us advice, of course we're going to take it, of course. Yeah. Fantastic. I love that. And, and I want to dig a little bit more into the writing, but before I, I ask my questions, I'm going to pop up a question uh, from the comments. Uh, and this comes from uh, Justin, who asks, what are your... What are your favorite horror books or stories that have inspired you? Well, I mentioned already the October Country by Ray Bradbury. Yeah. Um, 
once you've read like four or five collections of his, you're pretty much set because they're all, his style is, is, you know, runs throughout. It's not like you have to read every story to get something, but you read five, six books with all the stories. That's good. Another one that I love reading is uh, Robert Block. I've read just about every short story of his, except the Cthulhu mythos. I don't really get into Cthulhu mythos stuff, so I can pass right. on that. But one of his uh, stories is my absolute favorite. is called Enoch. And if you're not familiar with that story, I'll just give you a brief rundown. It's about this crazed serial killer, madman. He's in jail. And somebody, you know, a lawyer comes to talk to him. And the, he uh, start, they start talking and he says, ah, this demon on my shoulder he's telling me to kill i can't i can't get away from it i i have to do what he tells me and this guy is saying so you're telling me there's a demon telling you to kill he said yeah yeah i I can't help it and he says i'll tell you what i'll take it from you okay you give me the demon and then we can go ahead with her he says oh would you do that really would you turns out that there really is a demon on there and it goes from the the guy behind the bars on the other side now it's on this lawyer's shoulder and it drives him mad and i'm thinking oh man that's so brilliant and that's the kind of thing that i wanted to do and you know all the stories he wrote i found a kinship the humor and the horror which are very similar things they both uh, uh, elicit an, uh, an emotional response one is fear one is laughter but they're very close and the line between them crosses quite easily so uh his work absolutely and another one, everyone's heard of him, but they didn't know how many short stories he wrote, was Richard Matheson. Oh. He's along those lines, too. Contributed to the Twilight Zone, uh, all kinds of anthologies. He's got story collections going. Steven Spielberg's first feature-length film, Duel, was based on a story written by Richard Matheson. He's had many films adapted and uh, TV shows and things like that. So another hero of mine. And so those are the the core three, Ray Bradbury, Robert Block, Richard Matheson. A little later, Joe R. Lansdale, who uh, taught me how how some stories should end. And uh, I'm grateful to him for that. And he's just a really cool guy. So those are my my highlights, my my top three and a couple of uh, added in. Oh, I love that. I I have to say, I mean, I, I always cite Death Drives a Semi. Um, you know, because all the stories in there are fantastic. And again, I, I love that horror uh, humor element, which I want to dig into in a little bit. But um, Jeffrey Deaver, uh, who, you know, uh, the Lincoln Rhyme novels, he's most well known for. But he has a couple short story collections. And the very first one that came out was called Twisted. And and and, and Death Drives a Semi by you and Jeffrey Deaver's Twisted are just, if you want to learn how to write really solid short stories and, and, and you, you also want to learn how the writer can twist and play with you and have a really good time, uh, two, two really fantastic uh, examples. Thanks, Justin. That was a, that was a great question. Um, so, you know, I, I want to dig back to you and David Nickel collaborating on uh, Rat Food, which did win the Bram Stoker Award. And you talked about collaborating, uh, again, you had two different, you did have computer systems, but this was still back in the, almost the typewriter writer type up your story day. So you, it's not like you could just quickly text him is it, uh, and you could get on the phone with him. Uh, the email maybe existed, like maybe AOL or one of the, some of those early uh, emails existed, but you, you kind of had to get together to do a lot of the writing. And yeah, writing. we had to be physically in the same spot with the <clears throat> manuscript in front of us. And it was a, a chore to get one copy of it in one format finished yeah. because we had two different formats and we we're trying to get them all uh, work together. You talk about typewriters. <clears throat> I'll tell you this. I started in newspapers. I was a newspaper reporter just as we were transitioning from typewriters to computers. So I finished okay. university typing up stories on a typewriter when I read my first job, there was computers there. And <clears throat> it was so new that the keyboard, if you flipped it over, there was a little dial underneath. And you could turn it up or turn it down. And what that would do was give you a little clickety-clack sound as you were typing. The idea was that people needed to have that tack, 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 or else they'd just lose their mind. So you could turn it up and tack, 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 tack. 
while you're typing so let everyone know you're working hard or you could turn it down so i was just on the cusp of <clears throat> coming into computers when uh, when i started writing my first short story uh, published uh, baseball memories was actually written on the computer at work i don't know why i didn't have a computer at home i put it in there yeah I'd type it up on their paper you know people you know a more recent vintage don't realize how difficult it was actually to print up things and actually communicate with each other. We had email, but you know, that was like, Hey, how's it going? And you know, not more than that. That was it. Right. So, yeah. Right. Rat food. Uh, it was a chore to get done, but we got it. Did you ever do a round Robin style writing uh, where, you know, write, someone writes a paragraph or two and then you pick up the story from there. Have you ever participated in that sort of collaboration? <clears throat> no, I'm sorry to say I've never done that. I've, Rat was my only collaboration, and it just happened by happenstance. It wasn't that we set out that way. We were just talking. He came up with a good idea, and rather than just me saying, "Okay, thanks, Dave," said, "Okay, let's do it together." You know why not? Because we yeah. were work we were sharing stories through the. He was in the Cecil Street Regulars group as well. Right. So right. why not do it together? And it, I often wonder, like, I did a the rug and it was a finalist and you wonder also the difference between even a professional athlete right what's the difference between a guy who's on the fourth line and a guy who's in the first line or a superstar and with rat food i had the idea he had the ending and together we had what it took to win right yeah on our own each of us on our own not quite there finalist maybe but to win it's a whole different thing so anytime wow. anyone wins something i give them full credit because it's not easy to do and i often think you know was that it you know i needed that boost from dave i needed his part of the mind to finish it and he needed my part to get it started and that's how it ended up but no i've never done any other collaboration maybe i should have wow. because you know clearly it bore fruit <laughs> But uh, I've never done any of those kind of writings. Well, um, maybe there was a recent, uh, recent, and I wouldn't call it a collaboration, but an, an adaptation of, of one of your other award-winning, um, well, the, 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 the Werewolf, the Wolf Pack, the Wolf Pack series. You recently had the experience of having Hollywood turn Wolf Pack into a TV series. Can, can you yeah. talk a little bit about, like, how did that come about? And, and, and the, you know, what was that like? It was surreal and it's like magic. This book, this is the current cover, but it first came out in 2004. It won the Silver Birch Award, won the Aurora Award. That's great, you know. And when it came out, there was actually some interest, television and film interest. One guy was an associate producer on uh, the Survivor television series. Yeah. Another one said they had a development deal with Paramount Pictures. Like, holy shit, these guys are for real. They got juice. They're in the business. Yeah. Never heard from them again. Nothing. Right. Right. And that tainted my viewpoint for all time because, oh, you get excited. This is great. And then nothing happens. So. 16 years later, get an email from the, my agent saying, oh, there's someone interested in the TV rights to uh, Wolfpack. Bleh. Yeah, okay. Let's show me the money, right? Yeah, yeah. And then uh, about three weeks later, there was an offer with money. Like, holy cow, are you kidding me? And um, I still thought they were crazy. The book's out of print for 16 years and, uh, you wow. know. Nobody's come around. No, they're not even in print. No one else is interested in them. Okay, we'll take your money, you know, you you guys. And then, you know, eight months later, there's a, a press release saying Jeff Davis is going to be working on this uh, TV series based on the acclaimed books by Edo Van Belkem. And at that time, it was just a, a print thing. And I thought, uh, you know, it's going to fall apart. Right. These things do. You know, even big name directors get attached to something and Nothing ever happens. And I'm just like, eh, you know, so what? We'll see. And then like three days later, they put out this um, teaser trailer for the Teen Wolf movie. And then it came. And also in 2022, 
a new all new series by Jeff Davis based on the acclaimed books by Edo Van Belkin. I couldn't believe it. I said, oh, this shit's real. It's going to happen. I couldn't believe it. Like this is light speed for, for uh, production and television and movies. Like to go from doing the option to announcing that it's in production and then another eight months it was in production. Like light speed, just incredible. Wow. And when I saw that teaser trailer, I watched it for three hours straight every time. Like, <laughs> it's still there. It's still there. Like every time I watch it, it's still there. Like this is going to happen. Yeah. And it did. And um, I, I didn't believe it until it actually did happen because I was so uh, tainted or jaded by previous uh, Hollywood inquiries into my work. And <clears throat> it happened. And it's been the most fun I've had in the last, uh, in my entire career as a writer. You know, so much wow. fun doing stuff like this, you know, doing readings, doing interviews, uh, going, visiting the set, which we did going to Los Angeles for the red carpet, like, oh, my God, who gets to do that? Not many writers, you know, even the ones who get their things uh, done. I remember, you know, my friend Rob Sawyer, he didn't go to any premiere. They didn't invite him to the premiere, and I don't know if they had one, but oh yeah, he, that's he, right. was, he was envious that they, I had one and I got to be there, and, you know, and I was just stunned. It was just a great time. I can't, well, I mean, I can't Rob, um, Rob appeared in the pilot episode. He had a cameo in the pilot episode of Flash Forward. Flash uh, but Forward. he didn't, yeah, he didn't get flown in. So you and Roberta got flown into Hollywood for the, for the Red Carpet well, and everything, right? The contract we had said they had to uh, take us down to the set in Atlanta. So oh, to visit that. the set. Okay, visit yeah. the actors and the crew. and Okay. Yeah, we did that. They, were, they paid for two days. I paid for two. So we hung around for four. Okay. And the contract said they w would invite us to the premiere. Okay. So their uh, communications people said, "Oh, great news! You're on the list for the premiere." Which you know, if you when you go to the premiere, there's like a thousand people in the crowd, and you're on the list. Like, okay. Yeah. And then, but they didn't say they had to fly us there. And I give credit Jeff Davis is all his doing. Jeff Davis, who felt, he, who is by the way the showrunner and creator of the Wolfpack TV series, also did Teen Wolf series, was a creator of Criminal Minds. You might have heard of that one, too. Yeah. <laughs> so he um, he felt it was important that I be there. He wanted me to be there, even though I only talked to him for five minutes. Every time I see him, it's only for five minutes because he's always, somebody else wants his time. Yeah, yeah. I, um, I imagine he was a little busy, right? He's busy all the time. I'm thinking next time I see him, I said, listen, if you ever come to Toronto, I'll pick you up the airport and I'll drive you wherever you want to go. And that way I'll get at least a half hour and an hour to be able to talk to him. <laughs> but, um, you know, he respects the work I did. He respects other writers. And as a matter of fact, in the opening credits, it's there based on the novel by Edo Van Belkin, which he didn't have to do that. The contract says that credit has to be on the screen. Does say for how long? Yeah. Usually they put these things at the end where they zip by and you can't even see them. Yeah. And he put it right in the front. I thanked him for it at the uh, after party and he said, no, it'd be there all the time, every time. So I give him wow. prompt props. Um, I love the man. He's uh, yeah, he has respect for the work. I wish he'd put a little bit more of my books in there, but <laughs> there's time for that if there's more uh, series yeah. coming i'm sure something is going to creep in there but uh, <laughs> i have no complaints about the job he's done and i'm just looking forward to season two fingers crossed yeah because he also asked me to do a cameo uh, in right. season two so i got something riding on that and i just hope i said this before i hope i get killed so i'll yeah. show up one day to get killed and the next day in dead makeup and maybe they could just flash across and hey he died <laughs> for sure <clears throat> so it'll just be fun i'm just hanging out for two days it would be great so i look that forward to it and so at what point in this whole process uh, and it happened very very fast that uh you know the option was going to go to production and, and you know at what point did sarah michelle geller uh sign on to that project because it wasn't it wasn't immediate right it, it happened a little bit later well, exactly when she signed on, I don't know, because right. 
Paramount Global, which is now the parent company, when I did the option, it was CBS Viacom, now it's Paramount Global. She was probably on board early on, but they have a way of announcing these things to maximize impact. Oh, yeah, right? of course. Yeah. So <clears throat> she appeared for the first time at New York Comic Con where Jeff Davis was doing a hour long panel about the Teen Wolf movie. And then for 10 minutes at the end, Oh, by the way, I got this thing coming up and there's somebody who's going to be in it. And she came out on stage and like, Oh my God. So like, it's everywhere on the internet, social media, Oh mother, you know, that's her nickname from Buffy the vampire slayer. And so I don't know when she signed on, but I imagine she did well, she had very small parts in the early episodes, so she might not have shown up on set until halfway through the, the filming. I don't know. I can guarantee you, season two and beyond, she is going to be in a lot of scenes, and you know she's going to be yeah. the star. People complain that she wasn't really the star when they advertised that, but I think the story is that her role before she signed on was very small. Yeah. And once it was Sarah Michelle Geller, that role became bigger. And who knows uh, how big it's going to get. But yeah, she's a part of the the cast. And I'm grateful because, you know, what a boost to the interest and people, you know, deciding to watch it. So can't complain yeah. about any of that. Oh, that is fantastic. Um, uh, so cool. Thanks for sharing that. Just going to pop up a uh, comment. Margaret says, uh, hi, Mark. NATO, happy spooky season. Hi, Margaret. Thank you very much. Happy Halloween to you. Yeah. Um, so going back to that whole experience of the wolf pack and, and having the TV series, I mean, it, it obviously surreal to see an adaptation of something that you created on the screen. I think there's even a flashback. Uh, there's a, a flat, like they did, they, they readapted it, which Hollywood has to do, right? They have to do a, a different take on it than than your your family friendly <laughs> young reader, right? Younger reader, because Wolfpack is actually safe for kids to read, right? Yes, it's a uh, it's a family drama uh, for nine to twelve or thirteen year olds, and uh, nobody gets killed. <laughs> nobody <laughs> yeah. dies in my book. And they respect the law, they respect their parents and all that. And Jeff turned yeah. it into a supernatural mystery, lots yeah. of violence, um, yeah. sexuality too. And yeah. uh, I'm all for that. And, you know, every once in a while you're watching an episode and you think, oh, man, I wish I thought of that. You yeah. know, <laughs> the fact that uh, the ranger has uh, ma made silver bullets just in case he can't control his kids. Yes, oh, man. Would genius. I have loved to come up with that. They're locked away and somebody discovers them and he says, well, you know, you never know. So that was yeah. great. There was a couple of other things. I just thought, oh, that's brilliant. I wish I could talk to the writer who came up with that because I wanted to do that. But anyway. Right. Um, well, there's a scene, though, that reminded me of the books. It yeah. was the moment where there's the, the baby's hand and then it's the paw. Yes. Or the opposite. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> when I was met on the set with Rodrigo Santoro, he did say that there was this flashback scene and he was younger. And I thought, oh, for sure, they're going to have the opening scene of the book. Yeah. And no, they didn't. And I thought there was an episode called Origin Point. I said, oh, it's going to be in that, that episode. Right. And it wasn't. So we got to the end of eight episodes and it is only in flashback. Uh, he discovers uh, the wolves. He takes them home. And he's talking on the phone and then he sees the human hand come out. Very similar to the opening scene of my book. Now, yeah, they've obviously shot more film of that because they only use like 20, 30 seconds of all of it. And in season two, some critics have said they're going to divulge more about the Sarah Michelle Geller origin story and how the twins came out of the fire and that sort of thing. And when they do that, then the ranger has to explain how he found them, took them yeah. home, and he has to. It, it has to happen. <laughs> I can't imagine if it doesn't. And then yeah. I'll be like, ah, um, I can die now. I'm complete. Something that I wrote is, ended up on the screen. 
we'll see. Uh, I'm I'm yeah. looking forward to it. I think it I think it has to happen. They're going to well, be Sarah Michelle Geller, um, Kristen Ramsey, and Garrett Bra uh, Briggs. They might get involved in season two. I don't know. They right, might. Right. And they're going to talk about how the kids came to be where they are, and when they do, then that origin story is going to be there. That's what I'm I'm hoping anyway. Yeah, and, and it almost feels like it's probably going to be more dramatic to have it stretched out because you don't know the backstory. So again, you know, Jeff uh, Davis is, is writing a mystery adaptation. One thing I learned watching it on screen, the, uh, the first episode, and then my son, who is, produces television content, explained it all to me. And he said, listen, Jeff's done this before he's got a master's degree in, in screenwriting he's pulling it out drawing it out when i spoke to him on set he said i said well let's hope for a season two or three he goes he says no there's gonna be eight and i'm like wow eight <laughs> seasons well he might be confident and if he's drawing out the story for eight seasons he might have a rough idea of what's going to happen in each season right good on him as long as he but he's got an idea what he's doing and, you know, I learned early on, just because I wrote the book doesn't mean I know everything about it. doesn't mean I know anything about television and how to set up TV and what works good on TV. I trust him. Like, I trust you. You're the publisher. You know what you're doing. You publish the books. I'll be there wherever you need me. He'll do this TV show. If he wants me to be there and get hit on the head with something, I'll, I'll do that for him. He's the, the showrunner. Let him run the show. Just sit back and enjoy it, just like everyone else. Uh, well, I mean, uh, couldn't have happened to a nicer guy too to see to see this this fantastic series uh, get adapted into a fantastic series, right? <laughs> uh, so, and, and and the books are now uh, available, right? So you've got the first. You were holding up the copy of Wolfpack, so that is available. It's it's out. People can order it online. They can request it through the local bookstore, right? It's out in uh, hard hard copy in print. The other three are available in ebook format which is right. going to change yep. by next year. The second book will be out and by 2025, three and four will be out. And oh, I just God. finished writing an essay, Wolf Pack from page to screen, 6,000 words outlining how the books were written, how the, uh, the option process that I spoke to there, visiting the set, the, uh, um, the premiere after party, everything, the whole thing <clears throat> that'll come out with uh, the fourth book. Wolfman in 2025. Yeah. He also, the books are out on four audio books uh, narrated by Alan Carlson, a Canadian uh, actor, narrator. Okay. He's from British Columbia, which is cool, which is really good because he knows how to say all of the places and the, the names and everything. Yeah, like uh, I've had other things adapted by American you know, and they call it Ashawa, Ontario, and you know, <laughs> things like that. And they get it wrong, and they're like, cringeworthy. Yeah. But <clears throat> but they did send... Uh, and, and Regina, Saskatchewan. You got to yeah. remember that one. Yeah. But um, Audible did send a, a, a request. There, is there anything that needs to be uh, clarified right. how to pronounce it? And uh, I don't recall what I told them, but he got it. He got it right. And that's and that was your agent working dil diligently to get that deal with Audible, I guess, right? Well, strange. There was no interest in uh, print copies yeah. to reprint, but uh, the audio book, there was three offers and uh, Audible wow. was, yeah, which is great. You know, anytime you have people competing for your work is good. And uh, they came up with the highest bid, so it went there. So uh, no complaints. I mean, and uh, also it's been sold to... Um, Saudi Arabia, all four books. Wow. It's going to be in uh, Arabic. Uh, also, um, Chechia. The, I, I posted the cover online. And Italy again. It, when it first came out, it was out in Italian edition. And it, wow. there's going to be another separate, different company publishing in Italian. And, uh, yeah, the uh, Arabic one is interesting because the purchase had to be approved by the Saudi um, Ministry of Culture, which really? like, yeah, like they have to approve it and they provide the money for it. So 
and they also wanted a hundred copies that didn't count towards royalties. And right. um, I got a, actually a fan letter from a woman in Egypt saying she was so excited about the book coming out in Arabic and, and she had read blood road and she thought it was great too. And I was like, wow, this is cool. I mean, Oh, wow. <laughs> interest around the world in this and all because of the TV series, let's face yeah, it. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Not, yeah. I wouldn't have done that on my own, but <laughs> You know, you just never know the path that this the work takes, and yeah. uh, that was quite gratifying to to hear that from her. Oh, that is uh, that is fantastic. Um, I, I we've got 15 minutes left. I wanted to. I did promise there'd be a treat for everyone, so I'm dropping a link uh, in the comments. I'm also going to pop up the banner. Um, this books to read com slash death drives a semi is where you can find the book, you know, hardcover, paperback, ebook. You can order it through your favorite local bookstore, request it at your local library in ebook or in print format. Uh, but if you go to this page and you click on the Smashwords store link, you can actually get the book. Now, the book retails for $6.99 uh, in ebook. That's US. We're going to speak in, in US dollars because then that converts to, you know, the appropriate Canadian price, et cetera, et cetera. But if you go to the Smashwords store until, until, you know, after the witching hour on Halloween, so until November 1st, you can get Death Drives a Semi using this private coupon code, TKGMU. Go to the Smashwords store, uh, click on that, and you can get it for 99 cents US. Okay, so us Canadians have to pay a little bit more, but 99 cents US, TKGMU, only until November 1st, 2023, and that's with uh, Death Drives a Semi. If you're watching the video, you can always roll back <laughs> and check out those. I'm links. reminded of Robocop. I'll buy that for a dollar. Sure. Yeah, How could you exactly. Not? Death Drives a Semi for one dollar. Well, this is just us wanting to put some treats into those virtual bags of people looking for great, uh, great stories uh, as well. And see, uh, people are very excited. So, and again, uh, so, so again, and, and, uh, for people leaving comments right now, right now, because I had three physical books that I'm going to be giving away to people who comment on this while it's live. Um, and it's going to be random. But right now, uh, the three commenters, the, all the three commenters are going to get a book. So I'll, I'll be able to contact you after the video and and, and ship you, uh, find out where I can ship uh, the copies uh, of this, uh, uh, of the book to you. So, uh you know, the, you write scary stories, you scare people, you get them to think, you get them to laugh a little bit, you get you, you twist, you, you trick them in, in a way that they enjoy being tricked. Has, has there ever been a story that you've written that's actually really scared you? That's actually, you know, kind of like I, I, maybe you, I, you think about Stephen King when he wrote Pet Cemetery, for example. That was one of the uh, tales that he's like, oh, no, I, I can't publish this. Uh, did you ever have an experience like that with any of the? I can't say that I have. I've I've done pretty in my writing. I've done some nasty things to good people, and uh, sometimes uh, children. And like no kids allowed. I read that. It's in Death Drives a Semi. I read that and I thought, man, what a bastard I am. You know, <laughs> um, these innocent children are just wiped out because of you know, the adults in the room. And I thought ah, it, did, it is, it was a little disheartening for me. Yeah. And, uh, but, you know, that's the way it goes. And uh, ta-da, scared you. It's a horror story. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of when I was st started writing, I did a story called uh, The Great Keeper, which was kind of a, rip off of it and there was a monster behind a sewer grate and whatever yeah. <clears throat> i'd never even seen it or read the book but anyway um one of the comments was you know you can do as much as you want to people but i have a soft spot in my heart for dogs because this dog got ripped apart in there and uh, i think yeah like i've done terrible things to children in my stories but not so yeah. much uh, animals and um even in um wolf pack in the first uh, episode there's this dog the bella shepherd is talking through through the fence and this dog comes back to protect them uh, from the werewolf and yeah. there's a scene where you hear it um, 
yip or something because the werewolf like swats it away. But there is a, another scene of the dog running away. It, it, it's okay, people. The dog yeah. didn't die. It's all right. It's alive. It, we didn't kill it off. So, yeah, for me, it, it's it's kids, and I've done that. But uh, for other people, it's it's dogs. Who knows? Yeah, it's kind of funny that that, that the people have certain sensitive spots about. Yeah, it's okay to murder somebody, but don't don't kick the dog. <laughs> Whatever the case may be. <laughs> well, in my stories, uh, people who have it coming usually have it coming. But sometimes, you know, innocents suffer because of those. Yeah. You know bad uh, people who do things uh, they're not supposed to and other people right. <laughs> so uh there's uh we talked about blood road i think you mentioned blood roads is a zombie story um in death drives a semi but you also had uh and and i only uh, I, I listened to the audiobook it was only in the last year or two i think that i'm not sure if it if it was just adapted into audio but uh kilgore and company right which is which was a, a zombie story that or yes. novel you wrote Quite a few years ago, right? Yeah, I'll tell you that story. And the story you were referencing in Death Drive the Semi is called Roadkill, not Blood Road. Oh, but... Roadkill, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. I'm I'm correcting the host. I know it's Blood Road's one of your novels. That's why. Yeah. Yeah. That's the so vampire Kill... uh, truck driver. Yeah, okay. Kilgore and Company I wrote more than 25 years ago. And um Wow. Yeah, after uh, Blood Road and Scream Queen, and it uh, couldn't get it published. It's a uh, it's a post-apocalyptic zombie story where one way of handling the zombie horde is to gather them together and put them in cities and then wall the cities up so they're contained inside the cities. And then Kilgore is a reclamation engineer. He has a company that if you pay him, he'll go into the city and reclaim something for you. It could be a sentimental value, could be worth a lot of money, yeah. could be a valuable piece of technology, who knows what. And um, never sold in all that time. And then I just kind of gave up on it. And then a couple of years ago, my agent, Joshua Bilma, said, uh, you know, I, I can try it out at uh, Graphic Audio. And I said, yeah, yeah, sure, okay. And I, because it was on an older computer that I couldn't make work anymore and couldn't get online and couldn't talk to another computer, I just left it and then a year later he said you know you never gave that to me and i thought okay if he's still there after a year thinking about it i'll do it so i got my friend rob sawyer he got me into word star so he got has to get me out of it right <laughs> so uh put it on a disc which i had to do with wolfpack too as a matter of fact and he did that for me and he translated it into and then sent it along and that sold to graphic audio not for a lot of money, but it was just lying around. So, okay. So 25 years later, it's published in an audio format with music and sound effects and a, the multiple actors in the cast and everything. Very, very cool to listen to. And uh, yeah, I tell people about it and they say, oh, you know, that sounds like The Walking Dead. And I'm like, buddy, I wrote this about 15 years before The Walking Dead was even on TV. <laughs> and as a matter of fact, I think one of the things that was uh, working against it is because the zombie genre was very popular at that time, and everyone was writing a zombie novel or a zombie story and everything. But, um, you know, if anyone's an aspiring writer, write the best thing you can and don't give up on it. I gave up on it, but 25 years later, it was still there good enough to publish. So... You know, don't sell yourself short. Write something, complete it, get to the end, have faith in it, and then move on to the next thing. But don't ever forget all about it completely like me. You know, I'm a cautionary tale, but it turned out okay. But don't do like I do. Do that as I say. <laughs> well, but you have written lots of uh, stories that you're passionate about because you get an idea the, yeah. the, or the idea hooks itself into you and then, then you would write that? Um. Uh, ideas for me were, uh, I had a lot of them and I kept notebooks all the time writing down ideas. And for me, once I had the idea, then I had to outline, even if it's a, a few lines to explain where the story goes and how it's going to end. Because once I knew how the story was going to end, then I knew how to get there. I had to get there. 
start right. it and get there. And sh writing short stories is like a sprint. Writing novels like a marathon. And that was a sprinter, right? Got the idea. Here's how we started. Got to get to that end. No wasted space. No extra words. You know, uh, clear, definite descriptions. And make sure that everything's clear in the reader's mind. Done. You know, so, but ideas, yes, very important. I would wake up in the middle of the night thinking, what a good idea I just had. I'll remember it in the morning. And morning comes and you can't remember it thing right so yeah. even if you have a piece of paper and pencil by your bed write down a couple of words and get in the morning oh yeah i remember that yeah yeah <laughs> well i remember you also you, you had the notepad and stuff like that but you also as part of becoming a better writer you constantly had like a mass market paperback you were constantly reading right yeah i said before like aspiring writers are only interested in their own work which is unfortunate and you know, as someone who's been around a while, if you talk to an aspiring writer, the good ones and you know who are going to do something ask you a lot of questions. They don't just, they don't tell you all about what they're doing because really I don't care. But they ask you because they want information from you. And right. what I was doing when I was learning my craft, reading all the time, I would read like 30, 40 books a year. And uh, I would have, cargo pant pockets and my and a paperback in each one you know i'm in the bank line i read a couple of pages and i would read all the time good stuff and really bad stuff and that you think that's funny but how do you recognize what's bad you got to see it on the page you know what it looks like so don't do that you know oh i don't like that don't do that yourself and good stuff reading you know a master storyteller oh that's how that story works that's how it has to end right. that's how it has to be, get set up and you know those kind of things when you can connect the dots yourself rather than just reading about it and someone telling you when you can connect those dots that's when you're making real progress when you're able to do it on your own and you don't need anyone else's help so oh. yeah i did a lot of reading i don't do so much anymore my eyesight's going i need glasses but when it counted, I was reading all the time. Right, right. Awesome. And 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 writing great stories that we can enjoy, like the book we're celebrating tonight, The Death Drives a Semi, the 25th anniversary edition. Just a reminder, if you follow the bookstory.com, Death Drives a Semi, or go to smashwords.com, you can get the you can get the ebook uh, for uh, using code TKGMU for 99 cents. But that's that treat's only available until Halloween. <laughs> so <laughs> Trick or treat. Yeah, trick or treat. So, uh, Edo, thanks for joining me uh, again this evening. I appreciate that. I uh, I am so happy that I can enjoy these stories in, in print again. And thanks for hanging out and, and helping me haunt this parlor tonight. I had lots of fun. You, you know my work. You're asking the good questions. One flows into the next. And, you know, the time passed by. And... Uh, it was a lot of fun. Thank you for having me and for doing this. I really awesome. liked it. <laughs> Thanks so much, Edo. And thank you guys for watching live. Uh, those of you with the comments, I'll be reaching out to you so I can send you your copy of Death Drives a Semi. Happy Halloween, everyone. Happy Halloween. Thanks for joining us. May you stay safe and protected from those eerie things going bump in the night that you hear just outside the comfort of the firelight. It was nothing, nothing at all. Just some small critter scurrying about, nothing to be worried about, right? <laughs>